thank you very much. Uh, so I'll be talking about IBS and uh, specifically, can probiotics help? That's a big question that we always get and uh, I'm a pharmacist in clinical um, settings and that's uh, always what my patients ask me, my, my family doctors that I work with ask me. So let's start with the, uh, uh, first of all, I have no potential or perceived conflict of interest. Uh, I work with the Alliance for Education in Probiotics and uh, I work with the Hamilton Family Health Team. Sometimes during presentations, I have to use brand names of products, and it's not because I have a bias towards certain products, but because those products contain specific probiotic strains that have good evidence. And in Canada, the situation is that uh, one specific probiotic strain will have one or maybe two products only. There are no generic products for probiotics. So, Basically, we will be briefly looking at what is IBS and is it really a big deal? Um, you know, looking at uh, imbalance of bacteria in a gut, which Sandra mentioned is dysbiosis and connection with the IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. And again, looking through some of the role of probiotics in IBS and is there any evidence? So basically, you know, question is what is irritable bowel syndrome? Quite often, my patients tell me that, oh, people think it's all in my head, I'm just imagining this. Is this really life-threatening? Is this something that we should be worrying about when we have, I would say, more important diseases to look after, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, etc.? Is there best treatment? What is the, you know, uh, what we should try first? It's kind of a bit confusing for, even for us. Can we cure IBS? Do we even understand it? So this kind of leads to all different kinds of lots of years of research, etc., that led us, you know, to a few of the things looking at the prevalence first that affects up to 20% in adults in most of the Western countries. Females outnumber males. And I believe this is where this statement, it's all in your head, comes from, because we think we just complain for no reason. Um, onset is usually seen before uh, age of 35. And again, as I mentioned, is this really a big deal? Um, basically, IBS does interfere with quality of daily activities, quality of life. It affects sleep, ability to travel, diet, sexual functioning, ability to function in family, uh, go to work and perform properly. Uh, contributes to a loss of producti productivity. People that have symptoms of IBS, even they are not every day, in anticipation of flare-up, they might not go out to socialize or engage in different activities. Um, it's kind of almost hard to describe. It's not devastating pain, but it is comfort that doesn't go away, bloating, etc. And what is also frustrating, it can be constipation predominant, and then next month is diarrhea predominant. So it's never the same. So we start wondering, are we really imagining it? What's going on? And quite often, doctors will do and run lots of different kinds of tests and everything comes back normal. Okay, so what's wrong with us? So this kind of leads us to, you know, why do we use and why do we even look at bacteria for treatment for IBS? We observe there is abnormality in the gastrointestinal microbiota in IBS patients and this has been established and tested over and over. The ratio of good versus bad bacteria in the gut of patients, most of the patients with IBS will be completely reversed or it will be less of the diversity of the bacteria in a gut. So this has been established. So basically this is why there is lots of research looking in how about we actually introduce some good bacteria, live good bacteria, and give patients probiotic supplements, yogurts, capsules, etc., and then see if that will make any difference. As Sandra mentioned, that providing fiber and prebiotics, etc., to good bacteria in a gut really helps that bacteria thrive. But then sometimes, if we don't have enough good bacteria, not even with the fiber, it's hard to get and achieve good effect. So. Just to kind of go over what Sandra already mentioned uh, in, a, in, a, in a charts and what little video showed, that there is a difference between a normal microbiota or normal gut with lots of good uh, bacteria in it. Imagine this is lining of your gut, 
and there is a good bacteria sitting on top of it, producing lots of mucus, protecting the lining of the gut, protecting the immune system of overreacting, everything's fine. You have normal bowel movements, you have no bloating, no issues, you digest and eat, eat, um, all the nutrients you need, you, you find your uh, immune system does not overreact to anything. So then you have, now on this side, you have disrupted microbiota. When you have loss of good bacteria that is producing this mucus, that is fermenting food and doing that, so then you have less protection. You have then opportunistic good, bad bacteria coming in and communicating with your immune system. Everything is triggered too quickly. Even, you know, uh, symptoms can be flaring up any time. So this is what kind of a difference between good and bad is. So this is why we are looking at how we can fix it. So before we do that, so why this happens? Why we cannot stay on this uh, right left-hand side to have all good bacteria? Um, basically, the reason why, I was going to go back. Um, there are different uh, reasons. There is, for example, hygiene hypothesis that, you know, we kept our babies in a kind of growing in a sterile environment. We had washed the suture every time it hit the floor, etc., etc. So babies did not have chance to populate the gut with good bacteria early in life. There is also this missing uh, microbiota hypothesis, meaning we are not, we are transferring bad messages from parents, from mothers, to babies as they are born, and then it goes from generation to generation. We use antibiotics a lot, and they kill good bacteria, sometimes to the point that our good bacteria cannot restore even after many months after we stop taking antibiotics. Physical, emotional stress can be a uh, factor, and our diet, again, if you don't get enough fiber and prebiotics, we are not feeding the good bacteria in the gut. Infections can be a reason, etc. So there are many, many reasons why this this balance happens. So again, big question is: if you're going to use probiotics, if you're going to introduce good bacteria, which ones? How do we decide? When you go to the pharmacy, you might see something like this: vitamin A, acidophilus, vitamin A, D. I don't think that even your pharmacist can find it on the shelf. These are some of the pictures I took in a pharmacies in Hamilton. It's in alphabetical order, but doesn't make sense. Here, for example, you have probiotic, then five billion, then you have complete probiotic, then you have probiotic 10 billion, then probiotic 30 billion. So which one would I choose? What, what, which one is the best? It's very confusing, and sometimes we think, oh, I'm going to go with a stronger one or one with more strains, which is completely wrong because more is not always better, and more strains could actually result in those strains trying to kill each other to see who is going to populate the gut faster. So that's why we really are looking at, you know, what do we choose uh, for the proper um, effect. On this slide, you actually have these uh, probiotics featured in the stomach section, which is appropriate space for them. But then you have, for example, Align and Rexal or Store brand or Generic beside it. There is no generic for probiotics, I mentioned that before. So Align contains a strain with good evidence for IBS, and the box next to it might look like generic or equivalent or store brand of it, but it's completely different strain with who knows what kind of effect, actually most of the time, no effect whatsoever. So we might save, I don't know, $20, but you're actually wasting your money anyway. So this is why when we look at the probiotics, you have to go with the brand that has strain with good evidence. When you go to grocery store, you also will see all different kinds of yogurts with all different kinds of shiny and, and colorful labels. So this is why, you know, what do we do? I, I use pictures of my dog because I don't have to pay him for this right to use his picture. No animals were hurt when I was doing this. Anyway, so when it comes to probiotics, I mentioned I will be using brand names to make it kind of easier to remember. Those brand names contain specific bacterial strains that have been tested in clinical studies. So, for example, they come sometimes in a yogurt or a fermented milk product form, like Activia. Um, Align is a capsule. Tuzan is one brand, and Digestive Care Daily is another brand that contains different bacteria in a capsule. 
Ipsium is a new uh, product on Canadian market containing uh, beneficial yeast. So those are some of the products with the good evidence for uh, IBS. And again, those can be one to three or one to two a day. It, it varies because again, these products uh, are, have been tested in clinical studies and you wanna look for one that has good evidence. Uh, this list is based on a clinical guide for probiotic products in Canada. This guide is updated every year because we don't really know, you know, there might be a new study, maybe the, the product will change in, in a way or something, so we update to reflect the evidence up to date. So basically, in conclusions, uh, IBS does affect quality of life. It's not life-threatening disease. However, patients with suffering IBS do have higher risk of suicide. Um, those living with IBS have the imbalance of good and bad bacteria, which was established. And then uh, some probiotic products and functional foods have good evidence for relieving symptoms of IBS and improving quality of life in these individuals. Thank you.